just amazing to be with a God who cares, who leans in, and who really wants us to uh, believe and have our faith so strong, God, that we know that you are God. We know that you're in our life. We know that you're real. We know that you're helping humanity and you're helping those around us. And you're working on those around us, even though we don't know it or may not believe it. And you are working so powerfully. And we're so grateful just to be here this morning to honor you, to worship you, to adore you, because you deserve all praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. He is 
Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. We were having some technical difficulties this morning, so please excuse the different things. I'm really thankful um, that you joined us uh, today, even though um, some of you may have had problems logging in. Somehow our website, our Shoreline Church website, seemed to have crashed. So thank you for your patience, and thank you uh, for being here with us. And I wanted to share with you a little bit about our... Um, Sorry, I'm admitting people to uh, our uh, Women's Day coming up. We have such an amazing Women's Day, and I think somehow I fast forwarded a slide or two. So please forgive me. Today has been a little bit different. And uh, so our Women's Day coming up is coming up on Saturday, the 27th of February. And if you registered already, you may have re received a swag gift in the email. So uh, in your mail, not email, in your mail. And it's really cool with a lot of different things that we can use uh, just to relax and renew ourselves. But please set aside the day. It's going to be a great time for women getting together on Zoom from all different churches, Bakersfield, San, San Luis Obispo, Santa Barbara. And we're going to have such a great time together learning 
from young Gore, who's been a disciple for many years, has a family of uh, teenagers right now, and um, she's been married for uh, 16 years. And the interesting fact about Young is that she actually has 13 siblings. I can't imagine growing up with 13 siblings, but she has 13. So um, she's got a lot of experience in life to share with us. And so I look forward to um, having the women join us there. Um, you go to our website, www.shorelinecoc.com slash events, and there's a button that says Women's Day, and it has our information and um, things to um, be able to uh to register right there, a link for that. So thank you so much for hearing me and Gio's coming up right now. Well, good morning. Uh, we are excited that you're here. Uh, I'm gonna do a sermonion, a little communion. I'm gonna pray after this uh, devotional this morning. Uh, I'm starting at least a little series. It'll be off and on series throughout the year uh, called I Dare You Not to Bore Me with the Bible. Uh, a lot of times we as disciples, we tend to avoid the Old Testament, not because, you know, we don't like it. Sometimes it's just some bizarre things in there. We're like, what in the world does that mean? What is that? And so sometimes it's just easier to read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and, and read some of the epistles and the pastoral letters that Paul wrote. But Paul being a Pharisee, Paul reading and knowing his Bible and the writers knowing their Old Testament and knowing the literature of their day, and the Apocrypha, they had, they have all this background of a library and they, and they give us the, the New Testament and they, and they write it in a way that it can enhance your Bible study when you dip back in the Old Testament to see some of the uh, material that they're, that they're trying to draw from to encourage your faith, to strengthen your faith. So this morning, we're going to learn about the Bible in the Old Testament and the story of Abraham and how important that story is for all of us as humans, for all of us as disciples. The Old Testament, the first five books of the Bible, the Hebrews called it the Torah. Uh, some call it the law. It was instructions. It was viewed as something good, something joyful, something amazing. It wasn't this oppressive type of, uh, of rules and standard, but it was really instructions that God had spoken the first 10 words of the Torah to the Israelites on Mount Sinai, and that's what the Ten Commandments are. They're the Ten Words of God, and there were two different tablets. I think I told you guys that last week. So we're going to look at one of the epic sagas of the Bible. This is after the Tower of Babel. This is after God had uh, wanted the humanity. He was the God of all the humans, and he wanted them to spread out and multiply across the earth. They said no. We're going to build a ziggurat. We're going, to, we're going to build a place where heaven and earth meet. And we want you to come down and be with us on our terms. We want to make a name for ourselves. And so God does come down. But when he comes down, it's not what they expect. God scatters them by dispersing them through language and geography. And so nations are, are beginning to be established all throughout the earth after the Tower of Babel. And then God chooses a man in the Mesopotamian area, the same area where God dispersed, he chooses a man that will become his people, that will become his nation. Now, God's job was to convince Abraham that he was going to do it. And the conditions that God set up for Abraham almost seemed like God didn't want to do it. But in fact, God does want to do it. And he wants Abraham to believe in him that he will do it. You know, in the, in the book of Genesis, chapter 12, we read for the first time in the Old Testament about God coming to Abram. And we're just going to say Abraham for the just for the lesson's sake, but it's Abram to Abraham once he makes the covenant in, in chapter 15. But just to simplify this lesson, we're just going to keep calling him Abraham. God comes to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 in the area, in the city of Haran. This is not actually the first encounter that God has with Abraham. God has an encounter when he was back in the Mesopotamian area, when he was living in Ur of the Chaldeans. God came to them first. And we know that because Stephen in Acts chapter 7 of the New Testament tells us that God first appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia. And then he appears to him again in Genesis chapter 12. And that's the second time 
God comes to see him and God's following up. And where God tells Abraham is that he is going to have a child with his wife, Sarah. The challenge instantly that Abraham knows is that Sarah has been unable to have a child up to this point. The Bible describes her as being barren for reasons unknown. Now, this promise that God makes Abraham is absolutely shocking because Abraham has been obviously trying to have a child with Sarah and to no avail. And so this is a promise that is shocking to him, and it's unrealistic. And sometimes that's how we see God's promises. And sometimes we can get in the headspace where it's unrealistic, where God is not going to move. God is not going to work. And the facts of the ground defy all logic, all sense. So we start to have a practical faith in our life. We want to live by what's practical. What can we see? What can we observe? And so Abraham is 75 at this time. Sarah is 65 years old when God calls Abraham. And it's a lesson about fixing our eyes on what is unseen. It's a lesson about, you know, not things that we see, but things that we cannot see. For the New Testament, it's living by the Spirit of God. God is active. God is moving. And God chooses this, this couple to have a child. And it's a blessing when God tells you they're going to have a child. It's fantastic. But Again, Abraham is 75, and Sarah's, you know, she's past the, the age to bear children, and it's obvious that she is. And so in, in uh, Genesis chapter 12, we read, uh, we read that he comes in this counter, and, and then he follows up again in chapter 15, and God comes to Abraham. Now, for Abraham's protection, God comes in human form. And so when we read the Bible, we have to look for some of the language that's being said. The Lord appeared to Abraham. In verse 15, it says this, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. That's not a dream. It's something he sees. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield and your great reward. But Abram, Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my state will be Eliezer of Damascus, one of his faithful servants in his household. And Abram, and Abram said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. And the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside. They were in the tent. It was nighttime. So they're in his little tent home, and he takes him outside. Notice that language. God came down in physical form, in human form, to talk to Abram, to follow up on his earlier promise. And he, and he takes him outside, and he says, look up at the sky. Look at the sky, and can you count the stars, if indeed you can count them? Then he said, so shall your offspring be. Before Jesus comes through Mary, he comes to Abraham in human form. Here's an, a good example of an Old Testament example of seeing Jesus in the Old Testament. His name is not Jesus because he only gets named Jesus after he's born through Mary. And Jesus means God among us, Emmanuel. Now, here is God in human form encouraging Abraham, encouraging him to believe something he has trouble believing in. So as time goes on, Abraham and Sarah, they start to conclude like, well, God promised us a child. We're trying. We've been unsuccessful. Maybe, maybe God wants me to have a child through somebody else, and I'll still be the, the technical mother. Maybe God wants me to have a stepson. So Abraham and, and, and Sarah deduce through logic that God may indeed be wanting him to have a son through one of his other wives, and one of them is Hagar. And it says, and, she, and, and Sarah says to Abraham, go sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. They deduce logically. And Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, 
Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. They deduced that I'm too old to have a child. Hagar is not too old. She's, she's in the right age to have children. And so they deduce that this must be what God's will is. This must be the promise that God has decided for us. He said, you're going to have a son, Abraham, and maybe, and maybe it's Hagar. And so they're just logically going through this because she can't get pregnant. She's been trying for years. It's been a fruitless endeavor. It's been discouraging. And Abraham and Sarah, they start to, they start to, to doubt what God's promise is. And Hagar is chosen to provide her a son, a stepson, because they're living by sight. They're trying to be practical. They're trying to deduce where God is leading them. And so God was pretty clear he was going to be Abraham and Sarah. And so what God does is God makes a covenant in the next two chapters with Abraham. This is before um, his son is born. And in, in chapter 17, verse 9, God says, hey, I'm going to make a covenant. And we're going to have a, a, a ceremony here that was very common in the ancient Near East. This is not strange. It's strange to us but it's not strange to them. And he brings these animals and he cuts them and he puts them in places where he has to walk through like a column. And so there's a very uh, traditional a treaty or covenant uh, in the ancient Near East. So in chapter 17 or verse nine, it says when Abraham was 99 years old. So this is, again, time has gone by. Time is going by when he was 75. Now he's 99 years old and the Lord appeared Again to him, he sees God in physical form. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you shall keep, that every male among you shall be circumcised. And you're, you're going, ew. And you're to undergo circumcision. And it will be a sign of the covenant between me and you. And my covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant any uncirc uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people because he has broken the covenant. Again, notice God comes in his human form. He appears to Abraham. And this covenant is real. This covenant is vital. But why circumcision? Why circumcision? And when you read the Bible, sometimes you can start to think, and one of, the, one of the big misconceptions is that it was unique, and it wasn't unique, but it would be a sign of this covenant between God and Abraham. And so what we find out later through just historical texts of the ancient Near East, that circumcision was pretty rampant throughout Egypt. Um, it was also in other in neighboring nations. And so the Egyptians... May uh, uh, the scholars believe may have it may have circumcised the Israelites while they were in captivity, but they gave them an Egyptian circumcision. And so God makes His covenant with His people. And here's Joshua chapter five, just to give you a little background evidence that when Joshua takes the Promised Land, he kind of he he kind of has to remind the Israelites of the covenant God made with Abraham because they had not been circumcised. And so before they go into the land of Canaan, Joshua wants to make sure. That, he, that the people remember the covenant that God makes with Abraham to get circumcised. And he goes, hey, look, we're going to roll away the reproach of Egypt for you. We're going to make flints and knives, and the Israelites will be circumcised. And they call the place Gilgal, which means to roll back. And so Joshua uh, continues this, this circumcision covenant promise and remembers it during the time of taking the promised land. Uh, circumcision was not unique. And in, 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 uh, in the scriptures, it says it was done in Egypt, in Edom, in Ammon, in Moab, all who lived in the wilderness, in the desert. Circumcision was, was a pretty uh, common ancient Near East practice. So it didn't distinguish the Israelites as God's people, as some people tend to think. Like, oh, they're circumcised because the Philistines were uncircumcised. So therefore, if you're circumcised, you belong to God. That is actually not the case because other nations actually were circumcised. 
So in chapter 17, Abraham is aging uh, and he's frustrated. You ever been frustrated when you've been, you've been, you've been leaning on God's promises. You've been leaning on what he said. You're trusting in his words. You're praying about it and nothing is happening. That's where Abraham's at. He's frustrated and he falls down to the ground and he laughs. Uh, he laughs in front of God and he says to him, will a son be born to a man who is a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child? At the age of 90. And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. He's trying to say, God, you know, I'm too old. This is this is this is unbelievable. I can't have children. Sarah can't have children. Please, can we go back and can we bless Ishmael? Can you make Ishmael the heir? Can you do that? Can you do that, God? Can we go back and just just, 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 he's already here. Let's just, let's just work with our situation, God. And then God says to Abraham, look at, yes, your wife. He goes, yes, but your wife. He's like, he's understanding. I understand you're frustrated, Abraham. I understand you're doubting. I understand you're at your wit's end. I understand you're exhausted praying about it. I understand you're exhausted waiting on me. I understand. But your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son. And in fact, here's the name you are to call your son. His name, you will call him and name him Isaac. In fact, that's his name. So here's a little secret. God cares more than you. God cares more than me. God cares more about you than you think. Sometimes we think God doesn't care. He's not working in our life. What is God doing? I've prayed about the situation over and over and over for the last several years and nothing's happened. Well, Abraham's having to wait 25 years. 25 years. I've been a Christian just over 25 years. Imagine praying about, thinking about a promise, praying about what God can do in your life, and he has not answered it yet. And so Abraham is frustrated. He's frustrated because he wants God to act. And God has not acted yet. But God still holds out the promise to Abraham that you will have a son. And so chapter 18, he comes back again. So if you notice, God meets him in Mesopotamia. He meets him in Haran. He comes to him in chapter 12. Chapter 15, they do the covenant. Chapter 17, he, he, they, 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 um, they, uh, they enforce the covenant. I mean, God is constantly following up with Abraham. And I love that about God. He's following up always. And so in chapter 18, it says, the Lord, there's the word again. He appeared. He can see him. And we know from the text that it's in physical form. It's the... It's the Jesus of the Old Testament. John chapter 5, he tells the Pharisees, you study the scriptures diligently, but they all testify about me. And so he's the same figure in Daniel chapter 9 and chapter 7. He is, in, he is in heaven. He's the son of man that Daniel sees. This is the guy. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. So the Lord appears to Abraham while he's in his tent, hanging out, having a good time. And then he also, God brings with him three men standing nearby, which I find very interesting. So it's God, Abraham, and there's three guys in the distance who are going to go deal with a city that is unrepentant, is immoral, is sinful. And you may have heard of that city, city called Sodom and Gomorrah. And so those three visitors, part of God's council a heavenly host come down with God because they've been commissioned to destroy that city. And so and then Abraham has this dialogue with God and they're going back and forth. So again, God coming to Abraham. And then, and we pick it up in verse eight. He goes, where's your wife, Sarah? They asked him because the visitors, they come over and he has more for lunch and they're having a good time. And so he goes, they're in the tent. And then one of them said, as surely I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah and your wife will have a son. And Abraham said, well, we're very, we're very old. And, uh, you know, she's 
She's got, you know, look, can you, she's past the, the age. She's past the age of bearing a child. And so Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm all worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? Will I really have, will I really have a child now that I am old? When she said that, is there anything too hard for the Lord? You know, it reminds me of um, the passage in, uh, in Luke where Jesus says, with man, it's impossible. With God, anything is possible. Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, well, I, will I have a child now that I'm old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year. And Sarah will have a son. Sarah was afraid so she lied and said, I didn't laugh. But he said, uh, yes, you did. You laughed. And I think these are the times where, where, where think, we think that things are so hard and so difficult. You know, we had, uh, the, we had this Bible study that started last year. Um, it started, I think, in September of last year online. There was on the screen on the on the on this on the Zoom. There was a there was a name that popped up that we had not seen before, and the name was Lost Soul. And you may have remembered that name. It said Lost Soul one week, and I was like, "Who is that? Who is that?" And I was trying to engage it and say hello, and and then the, and then the other another time, uh, Inaj A N D uh, um, Mick showed up. This this really Hebraic name. I don't know what that was. And I thought it was somebody else. So who is this? We're having more visitors. But in fact, it was the same person. And then it, the name Kimbo shows up. And we're thinking, who is this? It's another one. We're blowing up. It's amazing. And then the another name, Kim, shows up. And then Kim begins to engage and, and attend our services. And so David myself, Edom, and Todd Saunders. We set up some time to look at the Bible, to study the Bible with Kim. And we began to study the Bible. And we went through all the studies. And Kim did not and, and would not at the time put his faith in God to believe. And we studied and we studied and we studied from September through December, we took a little break in the holiday for the Christmas, and we went back at it. And we studied, and we watched videos, and we studied. And in the back of our minds, we're like, I could be doing something else on Wednesday. And every week, we would just come back to the studies and end up in the pretty much the same place. And so we were praying, and we were praying, and Dave and Iram, we were all praying. Kim was praying. Everyone was praying, but he wasn't moving along. We're like, oh, my gosh. Oh my gosh, this is not going to happen. And so we just decide we're just going to keep studying the Bible until, until Jesus comes back. And we hope that he makes it. We pray that he makes it. But I was under the, the belief like Abraham, it's just not going to happen. He's actually not very open. Well, last, this, this week, or actually a, a week and a half ago, or almost two weeks ago, I forget the actual day. I get a phone call from Kim. And Kim calls me, and I'm going, oh, wow, it's Kim. So I picked it up, and I answered the phone. And I thought it was going to be another question about, like, one of those difficult questions he asked. Why this and why that and why? And I was like, all right, make sure I'm, make sure I'm ready to answer a question. And he goes, Gio, I'm ready to get baptized. I give up. And I go, you give up? I said, I'm ready. I said, I, I'm not going to know everything, but I'm going to put my faith in God. And I said, you're surrendering to God. That's the biblical term. You're surrendering. It's like, yes, I'm surrendering to God. And so just this last week, as you know him as lost soul, as you know him as Anaj A-N-D Mick, as you know him as Kim, was baptized into Christ and is now your brother, and there's Iram and Kim in the pool, uh, baptized. He is good friends with Jane 
And Jane is the one that invited him to church. He came and it's been awesome the way God used Jane and their friendship to bring him along into the waters to have a relationship with God. And it was an incredible, incredible sight to see. It was by faith, not by sight. I could not have predicted that day would come uh, just based on how we were studying the Bible and where things were at. But it was God who persevered. It was God who broke through. It was God that was working on Kim. Kim has been praying to God most of his life, but did not know who God was intimately. And I believe God acknowledged his prayers from a little, from a young age to an adult, that God was paying attention. And God, in his right time, in the right moment, called him and he responded. So congratulations, Kim. It's been an honor and a privilege and uh, to see you become a brother, our brother in Christ. You are the first person that I've ever started the Bible with over a computer screen who has come to faith. And I'm so thankful that we met for the first time on the day of your baptism. And I look forward to spending more time with you. In Genesis 21, Sarah's 90. Abraham is at his wit's end. God makes this ridiculous promise that he will have a son. And it's in God's time. And it's, it's when God is ready. It's because God has the big context. God sees the bigger picture. And in verse 21, now the Lord was gracious to Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age, at that very time God had promised him. Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. When his son Isaac was eight years old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. Abraham was a hundred years old when Isaac was born to him. You know, we can feel like Abraham in many ways when we feel like God is slow to answer our prayers, where God is slow to respond to our cries. And we can begin to live by sight and not by faith. We, be, we can begin to live by what we see and have this, oh, let's be practical when the Holy Spirit is at work in your life, actively working and God is working. So why circumcision? Why? One of the big misconceptions about it is that it distinguished Israel from the other nations. Well, we know that it didn't. It did not distinguish them. And we get that from the Philistines because they were uncircumcised. And they really were, but it didn't matter. That's not, what, that, that's not the reason why God instituted circumcision into the nation of Israel and why it was so important. Why circumcision? Because the miraculous nature of Isaac's birth is the key to understanding circumcision as the sign of the covenant. Because at, because at that point, every male who was in his household needed to be circumcised, especially the ones that witnessed it. And the reason circumcision is the sign of the covenant is because their entire race, their very existence began with a miraculous act of God by giving Sarah a child in her 90s, by giving Abraham a son in his when he was 100 years old. Circumcision was to be this continual reminder that Israel owed its very existence to God, to Yahweh, who made them out of nothing when it was impossible for humans to have children. That's why God wanted to wait and tell you they were so old, there could be no doubt of this miracle. There could be no doubt of the beginning of the nation of Israel was an act by God and God alone. And they would be his people and he would be their God. You know, many times we look at circumcision in the Old Testament and then we see it again in the New Testament. But in the New Testament, membership into God's family is circumcision neutral? In fact, it's not circumcision. It's not the identity in the Old Testament. It's actually faith in Jesus. And, and Paul makes it very clear that it's no longer. 
He calls it even the circumcision of the hearts. It's our faith in Jesus that makes us part of the church. And Paul connects that to baptism in Colossians 2. Just like circumcision, baptism is a response driven by our faith. We read the Bible. We see God's working. Our response, brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized. And it is our rebirth and our entrance into the spiritual kingdom. 25-year span that Abraham and Sarah patiently waited and struggled. In the book of Romans, Paul makes a reference to Abraham. He said he faced the facts with faith. He was like, this is unbelievable, but I will be faithful to it. I'm going to struggle. I'm going to have hard times, but I'm going to believe that God is going to do it. And that's why Abraham is the father of our faith. That's why Abraham looks at things with, with that seem, just seem unbelievable. But he goes, you know what? I'm going to deduce that God is going to do it. I don't know how, but God will do it. Even though he deviated, even though he stumbled, and even though he struggled, he faced the facts that his body was as good as dead with faith. And that faith was credited to him as righteousness. Jesus on the cross, we know, has died and raised from the dead. And many of us who've been Christian for many decades, we can look at the cross and we know it has impacted us. But over time, time can weaken us and God can strengthen us as we dip back into the word, as we dip back into the thought of the resurrection of Jesus. God will help us to remember his promise that he made to you that he will be with you till the very end of the age. God is working in you. God sees you. He sees your ups. He sees your downs. He leans in and he wants us to believe that he is working in your life. Just like he was working in Abraham's life. That the fact that God shows up in physical form if you want to call him the pre-incarnate Jesus, he shows up to encourage Abraham. And now that we in the New Testament have the Holy Spirit, his spirit is in us. God is in us and with us because of the resurrection of Jesus, which, which ushered in God's Holy Spirit. Let's pray together. God, thank you so much for the scriptures and for Abraham. And the example that he gives us, and just, just the realistic example of his life and the struggles and the bouts of frustration and at times doubt. But God, he, he reasoned. God, he believed. And God, give us that faith. Give us that faith that when we, when we feel like our prayers aren't being answered, we feel like, you know, we should thank you for some of the unanswered prayers. Because it was probably in our best interest that that prayer wasn't answered. But God, we pray, God, that you'll use us. We pray and are grateful that you'll use us in a powerful way. We pray that you bring us more men and women like him who will come. That we reach out. That we have friends that we're around. And we invite them, God. And we see them working in your life. We see you working in their life. We see them connecting with you, God. And we see them becoming our brothers and our sisters. Thank you so much for your love for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Would you lift your hands as we raise the only name worthy to be praised? Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are rolling. The praise of your glory. In Genesis chapter 14, Abraham rescues Lot from uh, the kings he was captured by. A great story, by the way. You should read that chapter. It's an amazing story of love, of triumph, and of God uh, leading him powerfully. And then when he comes back from the defeat of the kings uh, who had taken his nephew, and he comes back, and, he, and uh, Melchizedek from Salem comes out. He was a priest of the Most High God. Now, that language most high is, is because God had not yet revealed his name, Yahweh, yet. And he does that to Moses in, in Exodus. But before that, the scriptures refer to him as the most high of all the other spiritual beings. And so, Melchizedek has been acknowledging God as the most high being, species unique being over all. And Abraham and Melchizedek meet. And Abraham offers a tithe to Melchizedek, and Melchizedek blesses Abraham. It's just one of the cool stories in the Bible. Uh, Abraham, uh, it's one of the first recorded tithings, but you also had Cain and Abel, which is another story of even the motivation of why you give. Cain gave because he wanted God to bless him more. He wanted to acquire more, and Abel didn't. That's why Abel's offering was better because it was done out of a pure heart just to honor God, just to lift him up. And that's what Abraham is doing. And that's what you're doing every time you tithe, every time you tithe, every time you give, you give, you are acknowledging just because God is God and who he is. And you want to honor him with that. So thank you for your contribution. Thank you for honoring God and respecting him. Let's bow our heads and pray for it. God, thank you so much for the offering we give to you. Thank you for the church. Thank you for the kingdom. And thank you for just have us having a family together. Thank you for the full-time ministry staff that we have. It's Karen and I. We're so grateful to serve the Shoreline Ministry. And we're so helpful, grateful to, to be with the, your people and love them and encourage them. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, this concludes our service. Thank you for being here. We're going to go into breakout rooms, so please join us for that and have a great time fellowshipping. Uh, you, can, you can catch our services on YouTube, 805 Shoreline. There's deeper teaching classes that I do. Also, Karen does. It's on that if you want to uh, just dig a little deeper into the Bible, some of these different drop back, uh, backdrops of Old Testament. Uh, and Karen's been doing the Book of Acts. Uh, you can catch that on YouTube, and you can catch all our services there, or just go to our website, and uh, shorelinecoc.com forward slash. Have a great, great time in groups.